Hello, my name is Justin Waskowitz. I'm an assistant professor of forestry here at Paul Smith College. And I teach a number of interesting classes, including forest ecology, fire ecology, and uh, wood properties. But one that I particularly enjoy, it's actually a two-part class, partly in the summer and partly in the fall, is mensuration. Mensuration is the measurement of trees. And so I get to teach how to take measurements of something like this, how to turn what looks to you and, and me in the field like just a tree into a, a bunch of numbers that we can then uh, do mathematics with or find out um, <clears throat> how, how much volume is inside of it, how much potential product is inside of it, how much crown is up there to uh, provide uh, habitat for animals. Uh, I can, we can take enough of these numbers of trees in a plot, in an area, and determine metrics uh, about, about the, the land itself. One of the most fundamental measurements on a tree is the diameter, or how thick the trunk is. The simplest way to do that, to figure out the diameter of a tree trunk, is to use a set of calipers, which is what these are. So you would stand on the uphill side of the tree and measure at a point four and a half feet above ground on that uphill side. I've got that marked on my vest. It's called breast height. At that point, this tree, the, the width of the trunk is 13.8 inches, according to the caliper. Now, of course, a tree trunk is not perfectly circular in cross-section. They're somewhat uh, oval one way or another. So another approach that's often used is to use what's called the diameter tape. Now, whereas the calipers measure directly what the diameter of the tree is, the diameter tape is going to wrap around it, and it'll measure actually measure the circumference. But the values on the tape, they're in inches, but as you can see, each one inch increment on the tape is actually about 3.141592 inches apart. In other words, this is pi times the circumference. I'm sorry, <laughs> the circumference divided by pi. When I wrap it, it'll give me the diameter. You put the hook into the bark and keeping the tape tight as possible around the tree's circumference, we wrap the tape around. When the hook's in like that, the diameter side of the tape will be out. And we can see here, when we pull it tight, the actual average diameter, if we were to have put the calipers around several different points on the tree and average them out, it wouldn't be 13 point, it'd actually be 12.8. The tree's a little bit smaller than the calipers suggested. Now every measurement that you take has some amount of uncertainty to it. Now when we look at the diameter of a tree, of course it took it some time to reach that diameter. It had to grow. Every year it puts on a ring, as most people know, every tree adds a ring of growth each year. Well that's adding to the diameter every year. If I want to know how long it took to get to this size, I need to know its age. And to get its age, well, I can cut it down, count the rings directly, or I can use a slightly less intrusive method. This is a tool called an increment borer. And what it will do is take a thin sample of wood from the tree trunk and I'll be able to see the rings on that. So again, I'm going to work at breast height. Oops. And I'm going to go in uh, aiming as best as possible to where I think the center of the tree is. Takes a few twists to get it, the threads caught in the wood. And once it's in there, you can feel it. And all that's happening is the threads are pulling this hollow tube of metal into the tree. There's a very sharp cutting edge on the end. So a very small pencil-sized piece of wood is running up into the inside of the, the tube. Once I've got it in at least halfway through the tree trunk, and it looks there like it's well past half the way, I'll use an extractor, we call it a spatula, to remove the sample. I'll we'll slide it in, untwist one half turn, and pull it back out again, and there's our sample. Now as you can see, it wasn't perfect. I did not hit the center exactly. This ring here that seems to curve like a U-shape is the edge of a circular ring like that. So the actual center of the tree I missed by probably about a half an inch to an inch. I'd say no more than one time in 10 do you actually hit the center of the tree because it's never exactly where you think it is. In any case, we can see quite a bit in this core. At the very edge we have bark. 
is dark stuff. The spongy material just behind that outer bark is inner bark, also known as phloem. That's carrying sugars that the leaves produce down to the roots. Behind that is harder, it's wood, it's xylem. If you can perhaps see little dots in it, those are called resin canals. The pale colored xylem here is sapwood that's actually conducting water up to the leaves. The darker colored wood or xylem behind it, that's heartwood. It's no longer conducting water, but it's holding the tree up. In any case, you can see alternating light and dark lines on here. Those are the tree's rings. So we can count them to see how old the tree is, or at least how old it has, how long it has been since it reached this height. Because you remember, there will be a number of rings, a number of years that I will have missed. The amount of time it took it to get to this height won't re be recorded here. I will have had to bore it way down there. So, uh, I'll just count out loud real quick. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42 year old tree. At least at breast height. 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118, 119, 120, 121, can calculate the, the cross-sectional area, so two of the dimensions. Pi r squared would give me that. But I still need the vertical dimension to be able to come up with a volume. In other words, I need to measure height. That's probably one of the trickier and more error-prone measurements we take. To do that, we need to back up a little ways so we can actually see the entire tree. And from here, it might seem I can, but that highest point that I'm looking at is not actually the top of the tree. It's a branch that's jutting out toward me. So I have to get back a little further yet. There we go. From here, I can see the tree's top. It's actual top and not just a branch. And then I can use some fun tools and equipment to come up with a diameter. I mean a height. Ha, ha. There were other fun tools and equipment for the diameter. The fun tool that I use to get height is something called a clinometer. This is actually both a compass and a clinometer. The clinometer port is only the very top. What it does, well let's see if we can see through it. Oh you can a little bit. If you look through there you'll see a series of numbers are on the side of a rotating wheel. As you tip up or down, the numbers on that wheel change. Negative numbers if you're looking downward, positive numbers if you're looking upward. Those are angles. So I can't actually measure the tree's height directly. Instead, I can only measure the angle to the top, the angle from my eye to the bottom, and do a little bit of math to come up with a height. So here's how it works. You won't be able to read the numbers, I think, through this, so I'm just going to uh, tilt up and uh, I'll tell you what I read. So from where I'm standing to the top, I read an angle of 88 degrees. From where I am to the bottom of the tree, I read an angle of negative six degrees. Now what you do is you take the angle to the top and subtract the angle to the bottom. So 88 minus a negative six would be 94. So 94, uh, I said degrees, I misspoke. It's not degrees, it's actually percent. 94 percent is the combined value. And so what that means is that the height of the tree is 94 percent of my distance away from it. Now all I need to know is what my distance away from it is. What I do is I take the tape measure, I hand it to my assistant, <laughs> or I stake it in the ground if I'm working by myself. She'll hold it there where I was standing and I'll walk to the tree, find the distance. The tree, the center of the tree, is at 65 feet from where I was standing. So I'll reel back the tape and 94% of 65 uh, well, let's see, 100% of 65 would be 65, 5%, well, 6% less, oh, nuts, 
You know what, one of the best tools that a person carries on these vests is a calculator. Point nine four times 65. It would give the same answer, but uh, 61. Um, so if I want to get a volume out of this tree and I now know a height, 61 feet, and the diameter, about 13 inches, uh, I can treat it as a solid geometric object. Now it's not exactly a column because it tapers. It's not exactly a cone though either because it doesn't taper straight. Uh, the closest approximation for a tree trunk is actually something called a paraboloid. If you imagine sort of a church door rotated around itself, that's roughly what a paraboloid is. So the math for that is actually really simple. I'm going to take the cross-sectional area of the diameter at breast height. So uh, <clears throat> given its 13 inch diameter, dividing by 2, squaring, multiplying by pi, that would give me it in square inches. And then dividing by 144 would give me the answer in square feet. So uh, <clears throat> let's do that. Square times uh, <clears throat> 0.92, just under one square foot across sectional area here. Now if I multiply that by total height, so times 61, uh, that's 56 cubic feet. But that would only be true if it was a column. It is not a column. Um, <clears throat> a cone would be a third of the volume of a column. A paraboloid is about a half the volume of a column. So if I divide that 56, divide it by 2, I get 28 cubic feet of wood in this tree. That's total cubic foot volume. That's the, an important value if you're trying to determine uh, the amount that might be sent to a paper mill, for example. But it's not the right metric for sending to a sawmill because through a sawmill this tree has to be squared up. Slabs have to be taken off the sides. Some amount of wood in there, some amount of that cubic volume is going to be turned into sawdust as the saw itself passes through it. So we have another metric of volume called board feet and uh, that's a, a different, different animal altogether. In fact, <clears throat> there's no direct uh, relationship between cubic feet and board feet. It really depends on the tree size and the mill. Uh, but <clears throat> in terms of cubic feet, we can also get that to, to tell us uh, biomass, for example. How much would this weigh? Uh, <clears throat> when it's dried out, I know that uh, uh, pine wood is somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 pounds per cubic foot, so times 25. Dry, this would weigh about 700 pounds. Um, I know that carbon is about half the weight of a tree, uh, <clears throat> of wood anyway. So divide by two, there's about 350 pounds of carbon in this tree. If we're interested in carbon sequestration, we can measure it this year and measure it next year and find out how many pounds or tons of carbon, how many pounds of carbon one tree has taken in or how many tons of carbon have been taken in across several acres of forest. Um, <clears throat> so these metrics, simple measurements of diameter and height age sometimes, uh, fairly straightforward things, but we can take those back and produce a whole wide range of different measurements to answer different questions we might have about the forest ecology or about the forest economics.